we got pregnant and it was sort of after we'd stopped trying, but you know, we were so elated. And we called the hospital and I said, well, can you give me ballpark? I think the range was from 4,000 to 45,000. <laughs> I don't know what to expect in any way, but I also don't want to make choices based economically instead of what's best for me and my baby. And so that's really scary. Even yesterday, I was just talking to my mother because we started childbirth classes and they're saying, oh, you can use the bathtub or you could use the ball. And my mother says totally innocently, well, how much does the bathtub cost? <laughs> if you get an epidural, how much is that gonna cost? And I don't want to, think about that in my childbirth. I want to do what's best for the baby. The hospital, they're really trying to help us and the doctors are really wonderful. It's just, we're trying to make it work in a system that doesn't work. Um, so there you have it from Renee. Uh, a lot of people in this country are trying to make their healthcare work in a system that doesn't work. Um, that's the dilemma, and I've spoken to doctors, I've spoken to lawyers, I've spoken to healthcare advocates this year, a lot of journalists. Um, this is my first time speaking to entrepreneurs, so I've thought a lot about, well, what kind of insight can I impart from this amazing experience that I've had talking to all these patients? Um, and the good news is there's huge room for innovation in this um, dinosaur of a healthcare system we have. Um, the uh, but the guiding principle, which I'm going to put up on the next screen, and I don't want everyone to run out of the room, um, <laughs> is this, for me. Um, the goal of healthcare has to be health. And that doesn't mean, before everyone leaves, that it can't be a good source of profits and customer satisfaction doesn't matter and jobs don't matter. But I think what we've gotten away from in our healthcare system is that the focus of a healthcare system should be to deliver good health. And if it doesn't do that, to me as a physician and a journalist and a patient, why are we doing it? Now, of course, innovation will, uh, you know, can, is a very, very, very important part of um, this process as we saw with healthcare.gov. Um, you know, if you don't have the innovation, the health can't really come. So anyway, um, I w let me tell you a little bit about how Pain Till It Hurts was born. I'm, I trained as a physician. Um, the doctor that you saw on the screen is um, one of the rare places I see my name associated with that anymore. Um, my kids laugh at me since I, it was so long ago. But I did train as a doctor. Um, I trained in internal medicine. I'm the kid of a doctor. And I worked briefly in an ER in New York City, uh, pretty much at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, I came to the New York Times, um, and this will show you in a way how, how little we've moved in the past 20 years in some aspects, um, during the effort at the Clinton health reform, um, which I had been working in a city ER and I felt like so many of the problems I was seeing and dealing with were system problems. Um, we all know what happened to the Clinton health reform. I wrote about it for about a year, nothing came of it. And then um, I kind of had gotten the journalism bug and uh, took a series of foreign assignments over the next 10 years. And that was important to this series because uh, during those 10 years of living in other countries, I experienced a lot of other healthcare systems. And I'd also been out of the US healthcare system for a decade. So I didn't accept any of the, what we thought of as the, the kind of givens of our healthcare system as inevitable. Um, so I came back to the US um, in 2008 with pretty new eyes as I experienced healthcare. And I was pretty shocked, I have to say, when I was a, 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 an internal medicine doctor and a resident, there was a new antibiotic, now I'm really gonna date myself, um, called Augmentin, um, which we thought of as really expensive. It was like $35 for a course of, of Augmentin. Um, this is around 1990. So I come back to the US Augmentin is now off patent. I go in to fill a prescription for one of my kids, 
and it's $135. And I'm thinking, wow, how did that happen? That seems to defy the laws of economics. Um, likewise, you know, I've always thought of vaccines as pretty cheap. I go in, my daughter needs her HPV vaccine, and it's $500 a shot. You know, valuable vaccine, valuable antibiotics, but why are we pricing things the way we are? Um, when I lived in, uh, I was in doing a story in uh, Stockholm, I, I jog and I fractured uh, a little bone in my hand. I knew what I needed, but um, the Times in, in its wisdom sent me to like, you know, the fanciest orthopedist in Stockholm who put a cast, uh, who x-rayed me, saw my hand, put a cast on, and charged $400 with great apologies that it had to cost so much. Um, once I was back in New York City, I fell. I'm clearly a clumsy jogger, uh, broke the same bone in the other hand, and um, went to the, uh, I, I shouldn't name hospitals, went to a big orthopedic hospital in New York City uh, that treated the same injury um, for about $9,000. Um, and I had been an ER doctor, so I knew what that, you know, I knew I needed an, uh, an x-ray and an ulnar gutter splint and nothing more. Anyway, um, but the biggest surprise, and for those of you who've heard me talk before, I apologize. Um, you know, it's bad enough hearing a person talk about their colonoscopy once, but twice <laughs> is, um, you know, more, more than people should have to bear. But anyway, my shock of the decade was um, I came back to the U.S. at 50, and I'm a good patient and I knew I needed a screening colonoscopy. And I also knew that health insurance had changed a lot in my decade away. So I went to the health benefits person at the New York Times and said, look, I, I, I need this test. I don't care about going to a private doctor. It's a screening test. I just want it done, you know, efficiently, simply. And they said, and I don't want to pay out of pocket, so I want to go in network. And they said, well, you know, here's a list of hospitals in New York City who do screening colonoscopies in network, and you won't have to pay out of pocket. And I think, look at the list. I see um, that Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is on the list. They have a screening colonoscopy clinic. And I think, great, cancer screening, cancer hospital, I'll go there. So I go in on the appointed day, and I'm, um, you know, I trained in the New York Hospital Memorial System, so I kind of knew the hospital, I knew what was going on, and I'm a little surprised that for my screening colonoscopy, um, I'm getting a hospital wristband, I'm getting kind of a pre-op intake, I have that little bonnet that they put on for surgery, they take my clothes, I have booties, and I'm put on a gurney and wheeled into what I know is an operating room. You know, there are surge there, there's my surgeons, there's my gastroenterologist or the, whoever was doing it that day. There are anesthesiologists, nurses kind of scurrying around, monitors everywhere. And I'm a little worried. I'm thinking, well, this, this isn't, you know, this is going to, looks like it's going to get kind of expensive. But, you know, the, um, a dose of propofol quickly cleared all of my concerns. <laughs> And, um, you know, the good, the good news was I woke up, I had a, you know, my colon was in great shape, and I didn't think much more about it until about a month later where I got my explanation of benefits statement, which I hadn't really experienced very much before because when I left the U.S., we had, uh, I don't know that we got explanation of benefits statements regularly, and there was much less employee contribution, so there was less need to show patients what, they, what was being spent on their behalf. Um, so anyway, my explanation of benefits told me that my, my good screening colonoscopy had cost $12,000, which was pretty, pretty high, and that my insurer, good news, on my behalf, had negotiated the price down to a mere $8,000. And so uh, my responsibility was zero, and I, I guess I should have felt good about that because I didn't have to pay, but I didn't. I was really upset. Um, so anyway, with these collective experiences, I, I, uh, and this is something, a theme that I want to kind of ha have everyone keep in mind, is that we tend to focus on the patient responsibility, and as long as that's not very much, we forget about the background price, which is really a problem because the premiums go up year by year by year, and obviously Medicare is, is having trouble being funded. So I, I think... Patient responsibility is important, but we have to focus on the, the price in the background, too. 
Um, so anyway, when the ACA uh, came up during the 2012 election and I was asked to come back to covering health reform, I'd been doing environmental coverage until then, I said, you know what, the only thing I really want to do is to do a series on health care pricing because I want to know where the money's going, why are the tests costing this much. And I didn't want to focus on um, the half million dollar or million dollar treatment for for a rare cancer or an unusual disease because I'd read those stories and, and they were always really moving tales um, and they really were, you know, problematic. But I think most people, I'm a journalist, so when people read those stories, their first reaction isn't, wow, that's terrible, it's, wow, I hope I don't get that cancer. Right? It's, it's very, people are very focused on themselves. So my, my construct for the series was, um, I want to write about common things, things that ev all readers of the New York Times will have experienced, and have them start questioning why we do medicine the way we do it in the United States, and could we do it better? Because there's a lot of kind of, uh, there's a lot of this feeling of ev inevitability about US medicine. Oh yeah, it's expensive. Oh, you know, oh yeah, we don't get what we pay for, but how, what, well, how could we do something differently? So, um, you know, I guess you, you all are, are business people. Um, my editor was a little skeptical that people would want to read this, so I did what I guess um, people in business would call a market test um, by doing a little blog post for our well blog where I wrote about, and oh no, well, this is, I'm behind myself in my slides. I, I wrote about um, a study that appeared in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine. It was a little study in which a college student spent her summer calling hospitals, 102 hospitals around the United States, asking them what they would charge for a hip replacement for her fictional 62-year-old grandmother who was not insured but was able to pay. Um, this college student uh, spent the whole summer doing this. She was dogged, called repeated times, and as you might guess um, from those of you who had experience with health care, uh, despite repeated calls, fewer than half of the hospitals could give her a price, and those that could give her a price, the price ranged between $16,000 and about $194,000. Um, so there you go. Um, so what's a consumer supposed to do? Um, what I did learn for me and my, my kind of selfish goal in this was um, th this post was up for a few hours. Our well blog um, put a little box at the bottom asking readers if they could relay their experiences. We got 500 comments and my series was off and running. Um, I will say, as you'll see, many of the people you'll meet in the presentation are people who responded to that first call out for comments. Um, the first story, which you'll see uh, shortly, got a few, huge response. We had 15,000 comments. Um, uh, uh, these are some of them. Uh, it's the largest number of comments. Um, uh, well, I, if we, as a metric that we use at the New York Times, our gold standard, um, that's more comments than Nate Silver got on election day 2012. <laughs> so I, I, I knew we, we'd hit a nerve. Um, also, the series in and of itself has had more comments than any uh, series in the history of the New York Times now. And I think they're worth, you know, if you all are interested in reading through them, we have the series online, it's outside of our firewall, and the comments are kind of a catalog of all the ways that this health system is not doing a good job by patients, which may give you some ideas of things you could do to make it better. Um, and remember, these are New York Times readers. They are people who are insured, um, who have money, um, and who are pretty good medical consumers. Um, they may give you some ideas. What, what they did for me in terms of making a series is I have to say when I was covering healthcare in the 90s, one of the difficult things is it's always hard to find patients who are willing to go public, who are willing to be the public face of a disease. We tend to think of uh, you know, disease is kind of personal and healthcare is private. Um, 
but for this particular series, um, I, I had people like, I, I felt like I was a Hollywood producer, you know? I had people vying to be, well, how come you didn't pick my hip replacement? You know, mine was, mine was really expensive too. My, my, my best patient um, was uh, a wonderful woman named Lee Higman from uh, Idaho, retiree who was 71, who called and insisted, and she was in the paper, that we write about her experience. Uh, she had, um, she ordered her vaginal feminine, uh, her vaginal estrogen tablets from an online pharmacy in Canada, and her shipment last year was impounded at the Los Angeles airport as illegal contraband by the FDA. So she wanted me to, to, to kind of relay that experience. It's hard. I had never thought I would get, um, a, a, you know, someone wanting to talk about the vaginal, their, their vaginal estrogen tablets. But she was pissed. And the reason she was ordering them from Canada, obviously, is because it cost her a tenth. She's a retiree living on a fixed income. And the same exact tablets cost 10% uh, what they do in the U.S. just over the border. And her response to the FDA, which is why I love the people in this series, um, impounding her tablets was to visit her, a child in Seattle, and drive over the border and pick them up anyway. So um, anyway, so let me give you a, a, a quick tour of the series. And I'm going to talk about what I learned. The idea was each article was supposed to look at a different kind of market failure, cost issue. And um, each of them raises questions about how we could do things differently and better and new opportunities for how we could change healthcare. Um, the first article was on colonoscopy. Now you know why. Um, the, the, and, and the patient was a woman named uh, Deirdre Yapalader, um, who lives just outside of New York City. This is where she had her colonoscopy. Um, as you'll notice, um, she had her colonoscopy at the Long Island Center for Digestive Health. Um, you'll notice it's in the same building as Gastroenterology Associates, and that's because the two of them are quite tightly interlinked. Um, the Long Island, if you get off the elevator at the fourth floor at this building and you go to the left, you're in Gastroenterology Associates, which is a large group practice of uh, gastroenterologists. If you go to the right, you're in the Long Island Center for Digestive Health, which is um, a not so, well, fairly recently opened uh, outpatient surgery center uh, wholly owned by the uh, doctors at the, long, at, at the at Gastroenterology uh, Associates. Now, 10 years ago, those doctors would have done their screening colonoscopies in their office suite. Um, they would have monitored their own patient and they would have administered their own um, sedation. But by moving this, and with the help of a um, healthcare consulting firm that does this for uh, gastroenterology practices, they opened a surgery center and that allows them to collect for every procedure they do a facility fee and also to um, involve the services of an anesthesiologist. Um, and that obviously raises the costs a lot. Um, so these are um, Deirdre's bills. Um, when you look at them for the first time, and when, when Deirdre looked at it, she thought, wow, you know, uh, the gastroenterologist is kind of the bargain in this, uh, until you realize that the gastroenterologist is also um, getting uh, the facility fee. Um, her, the total for her, um, her colonoscopy was, as you see, 64000 Her insurer paid about 4000 The second patient I put down there because uh, I want you to see what a difference it can make in costs. Uh, Maureen O'Rourke, she had one at a hospital for about 9000 and one in an office for about 5000 Same doctor, same indication. Um, the only reason one was done in a hospital and one was done in the office is because as many doctors, they have some hospital days and some office days, and it was just about convenience. And I would guess, in this case, the doctor really didn't know or think about what kind of effect that would have. So what can we say, you know, what, how could we maybe make this better? Oh, sorry, I don't have. Um, 
because what you, what you see in colonoscopy is what you see with what we saw with hip replacement. Um, the, the highest price market for colonoscopies nationally is New York City, so hence my, my experience. The lowest uh, is in which, where the average is about uh, 9,000. Um, in Baltimore is the lowest market for about 19,000. Here in San Francisco, we're kind of in the middle at about 5,000. Um, and I should say, when you call, uh, when I called hospitals in Europe and gastroenterologists in Europe to say, what's your facility fee, there was this kind of silence at the other end of the phone. And you could hear like the head scratching. And finally they would say, what do you mean a facility fee? You can't do a colonoscopy without a facility. It's just kind of what's part of the practice. And I should add, and you know, you can argue about what the right price is. Many people would say, and I think I would probably agree that the price is too low in much of Europe, um, but for a test that's really valuable. But um, gastroenterologists in uh, Austria and Germany are paid about $300 for colonoscopy, and that includes everything. Um, so anyway, what can we do about this? Um, one thing that's interesting that's in the works now is looking at site-neutral reimbursement. Part of this whole facility thing, facility fee thing came as a result of uh, hospitals and surgery centers talking about their expanded costs. So it made sense. Medicare at some point said, okay, we're going to give you a, a, um, a facility fee and it's going to be higher to reflect your, your um, higher costs of operating a facility. Of course, what that means is that everything moves to a facility because you can charge a facility fee. Um, another option, which I know Kaiser is expend, uh, experimenting with here, is there's a lot of evidence that we overuse colonoscopy here in the US. There are a lot of other tests that are pretty good at detecting colon cancer. And uh, Kaiser is doing a lot of work with uh, uh, fecal immune tests, uh, you know, which, which maybe you don't want to do it every time, but maybe as an interim thing that would make sense. And I can bet if you gave a lot of patients options and, such t and laid out the pros and cons of colonoscopy versus fecal immune tests, um, a lot of people would opt out of that, um, you know, wonderful 12 hours of Movi prep the night before. So again, next we moved on to pregnancy. Uh, Renee, who you've met before, um, as I mentioned, she had to uh, go through her pregnancy as if she were shopping at a, um, a kind of bazaar. Uh, the good thing about, one good thing about the Affordable Care Act, it is no longer possible to have new policies that do not include maternity care. She had uh, an, old, an older policy. Um, so you can see these were the charges she negotiated. I should mention that these were the charges she negotiation, negotiated at the hospital. She delivered at, at the hospital where her father-in-law is chief of pediatrics. So they got a pretty good deal. Um, and this is what it cost. And you can see um, the overall charges in the US are quite extraordinary compared to other countries. Um, we pay, and, and this, I, sh I should add, doesn't include uh, anesthesia cost and doesn't include some of the prenatal testing as well. So we pay a lot more and we get pretty much the same thing. We get a much more medicalized version of it though. Um, I had one patient who, who we talked about in the series, who I talked to for the series. She was a family practitioner at Georgetown and she was determined for her third child to try and reduce these kind of charges. So for her third child, um, she came into the hospital 10 minutes before she delivered. She brought her own heating pad, her own Motrin, and she had said to them, I'm keeping my son Aaron with me in the room. Um, she thought she had the last laugh, and she thought she'd gotten around this, but in fact, the hospital, uh, when she looked at her exp explanation of benefits, um, the hospital had charged her um, for various fees, inc including a rooming in charge for her son, Aaron, that was this, which was the same as the um, baby unit. So anyway, um, what could we do for this? Um, one of the things that 
I discovered from this series, which I was really surprised about, is that many insurance policies don't cover um, midwife care, surprisingly, because it's much cheaper. Um, what about if, and I'm just throwing out ideas now, I was thinking, well, what if we had a policy that said, okay, you go to midwives first. It's cheap, you know, we give people a little bit of a discount for saying, I'm gonna go with a midwife first, and if that doesn't work, then I'll get referred to a doctor. Um, and we certainly should be providing uh, coverage for midwives for our policies, because that would save a lot of money. My next, my, my favorite all-time consumer as patient is Mike Chopin. Um, and I want to show you, he, he um, had his, well, let me tell you a little bit about his story before showing you his video. Um, Michael Chopin is the ultimate patient consumer. He, once again, he had insurance, but his degenerating hip was the result of an old sailing injury, so it was considered a pre-existing condition and his uh, insurer would not cover a hip replacement. Um, he's a photographer. He was pretty much disabled and couldn't work. So he started trying to price out care. He was living in Seattle. He went to, to a Swedish hospital, got an estimate for three days there. Uh, he found the surgeon he wanted and got an estimate from him. And what I love about Mike Chopin is he even did research to find out what kind of artificial hip he wanted. He settled on a striker device and found someone who knew someone through an old sailing buddy who could get him a wholesale hip implant for the surgeon to put in. Um, and he added up all those numbers and what he realized was that it was gonna eat up a big part of his retirement savings. And he started researching going overseas and he wasn't gonna go, he, 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 I mean, I told you, he's a good researcher. So he looked at which countries had really low infection rates, good success with hip replacements, and he ended up getting his hip replaced at a hospital just outside of Brussels for $13,000, um, which, as he will tell you, is uh, cheaper than the, imp the wholesale hip implant in the United States. So I want to show the next little video. This is comparing two surgeries, Mike Chopin's surgery in Belgium with uh, Susan Foley, who lives in Oakland, who had her, her uh, knee replaced at a hospital in the Bay Area. I needed a hip replacement, and I started looking into what it cost to have it done. It came to $112,000, 112317 dollars total charges for the hospital. Uh, I, you know, I'd heard about having surgery overseas. Basically, the price was $13,660 for everything. The surgery, the rehab, the flight over and back, two people, uh, crutches, medication to take home with me, and everything. This is not the prosthetic. This is not the anesthesiologist. This is not, you know, anybody who actually did anything. This is just the hospital bill. Total cost of hip surgery in Belgium, including everything, cost just about six to seven hundred dollars more than the wholesale cost of just the prosthetic device in the United States. The good thing about my knee surgery was getting my mobility back and getting my life back. And it enabled me to start horseback riding at 68, 66, which most people don't start horseback riding at 66. Yeah. And I couldn't be doing that without, without the joint replacement. I bought a new board, new snowboard, new boots, all the stuff, because I'd given it up years before because I couldn't, and started riding again. And I was pretty cautious for the first year just because I, I was scared of falling. Um, but this past year, I taught 26 days on the mountain. I mean, I'm stronger than I've been in a decade. Um, what I discovered in this case was I w where this led me was looking at the price of, uh, of orthopedic implants, whether it's hips, knees, uh, implants for back surgery. And I wanted to call the companies about to explain their pricing paradigms. And I discovered as I started calling around to the companies that they all had this, or most of them had the same area code, which seemed a little weird to me. And it turns out that um, most of the orthopedic devices in the United States, and indeed um, most in the world, originate from 
most in the, de the developed world, originate from a little town in northern Indiana called Warsaw, which is the orthopedic device capital of the world. Um, every, all of, or uh, basically everyone in, of Warsaw's 21,000 people works in the device industry. And a, as someone told me kind of jokingly, a mixed marriage in Warsaw is when one person works for Johnson & Johnson and the other works for um, Stryker or I, I think I may be getting the companies wrong in that quote, but, um, but what it means is we like to say that a, a market with five manufacturers should lead to competition, but it doesn't in this little town. Um, everywhere, I don't, and I, I, I'm not saying there's any kind of active collusion at all, but everyone kind of looks at each other and goes, are you good selling these joints for 20,000 bucks a piece? Uh, yeah, I'm good. You're good? Yeah. So, and you know, who suffers? The patients. And the, the orthopedic surgeons are kind of co-opted very cleverly. Um, the representatives from the companies uh, focus on training programs. Um, I don't know that many people know that when you get a hip replaced or a knee replaced in the United States, there's someone from the device company in the operating room helping out. Um, so it makes it very hard to break into that market. So I guess my challenge to you all as entrepreneurs is how come we don't have, um, and when you look at the prices of these devices, and my next story is about a guy who had back surgery, single screws for $5,000. These are not anything very elaborate. So the challenge I think from an entrepreneurial point of view is why can't, why can't we have um, generic devices the way we have generic drugs. That would make a huge difference. Um, next up was, and I'm, as Asman Hailers, um, I wanted to do something about uh, prescription drug costs. I didn't know what drug to focus on until I was interviewing a patient named John Aravosis in Washington, D.C. about his cataract surgery, and he mentioned to me that every summer he pays for his ticket to Paris by buying his Advair inhalers at pharmacies there. That's the price difference. And now I want to show, can we show, I hope this next one works, because <laughs> the next one is my favorite all-time graphic in the New York Times. That looks like it should work. Okay, so as, as, we, as I play this graphic for you, I, uh, just keep in mind, these are uh, manufacturers' recommended sale prices. So these are not about socialized systems, government discounts. These are real prices. So QVAR, an asthma inhaler in Greece. Advair, which was financing Mr. Aravosis's trip to France each summer. Rhinocort, uh, a nasal steroid for allergies. <laughs> and I, my, you know, my little soapbox that I probably shouldn't say because journalists aren't supposed to have opinions, but. This is something that is over the counter in most of the world. Augmentin, my favorite antibiotic. 15 in the... N okay. And best, um, last but not least, is Colchris. I'll tell you the story after you see it. Colchris is, is, is an ancient drug for gout. It, it's colchicine. It's been around for centuries. Um, the FDA, in, in, you know, in a, in a kind of you know, spasm of good intentions gone bad, wanted to have older drugs tested according to modern standards. Um, it offered companies that were willing to do that testing. And colchicine was never a, a medicine that anyone thought was a problem. Um, but in order to do the testing, it offered the, any company willing to do it, exclusive sales licensing. I think not talking about, well, what are you going to charge once you get that license? And this is what happened. Uh, uh, Colchris, Colchicine went from being pennies a drug to, uh, pennies a pill to several dollars a pill, which is a real problem if you have gout. Okay. So again, you know, 
let's think about what we could do to bring cheaper drugs to market. One thing, of course, is a policy issue. Uh, we're the one country that doesn't negotiate at all for drug prices. Um, in doing that, we probably, and I think the critics are right in saying that we probably subsidize drug development for the rest of the world to some extent, so that's something we have to think about. Um, a very interesting experiment is going on in Maine at the moment. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but um, it provides some opportunities. Um, you know, how do we have cheaper TVs? It's because if we don't sell American TVs cheaply, we go buy them from elsewhere where they do make them cheaply, the same as air conditioners. Um, but the importation of prescription drugs is currently illegal, except in Maine, where um, uh, the state has decided to allow limited importation for personal use, and there are online pharmacies in Canada and Great Britain trying to serve the main market now. So this is uh, very much in evolution and hasn't been tested. Uh, and it remains to be seen what the FDA is going to do about this. Um, oh, oh, sorry. I'm and I'm running really behind, so I'm going to move through quickly. Um, ben Bellar it was a kid with, with stitches. I wanted to do something about hospital pricing. That brought me to San Francisco because when we looked through our database, um, in fact, I had two people complaining about high-priced stitches, um, both on the same day here in San Francisco at California Pacific Medical Center. So um, for better and worse, California Pacific Medical Center became my the subject of the story on high hospital pricing. The stitches bills I saw ranged from $1,000 to $46,000, and some of these were just kids getting glue put in their wound. Um, I want to show you one last, uh, one last add-on for this. Um, one of the reasons our, ho our, our hospital prices end up being high, which is not necessarily good value, is what we think of, um, we made this online quiz um, called, which I encourage you all to take. <laughs> it's called, is this a hospital or a hotel? Um, you can get it on our website. Um, anyone want to guess on this one? Yeah, that's Children's Hospital. This one? Hey, I think you guys are pretty good. <laughs> uh, uh, Hopewell, New Jersey. A place where I should point out my daughter, who recently graduated from Princeton, was in the, at this hospital, was taken to the ER, and had a $32,000 workup to rule out appendicitis with a very expensive uh, $12,000 CT scan and $9,000 sonogram before she went back and took a final. So um, I'm currently disputing this bill. <laughs> um, but now I see what it paid for. <laughs> um, I'll do a few more, but you can do these on your own. Hospital, hotel, I think this is, yeah, Baylor. Anyway, you get the picture. Um, so, you know, let's, Let's think about, too, as we build hospitals and design healthcare systems, what's health and what's amenities. How about, for example, I, I'm a patient who cares much more about the health than the amenities. Why don't we have kind of bare bones hospitals that don't do, you know, I don't care about the thread count in my sheets and I don't care if there's a Starbucks in the lobby, I just want the health care. Or maybe we could do what they do in Singapore, which I think is an interesting model, where your insurance covers the, the health care and then you pay based on how much it matters to you for different levels of accommodation. That would be an interesting model to, to pursue in the United States. Uh, these are some of CPMC's charges. As you can see, it's expensive. The cost of the hospital day in the U.S., much, much more than in any other country, partly because of the amenities. Um, and this really makes me nuts when I talk to friends and patients because they go, oh, it's a great hospital. There's free coffee in the lobby. And I'm like, grr, you know. I'll buy you coffee and, you know, give me cheaper hospital charges. 
Just so you can see, this is Mike Chopin's hospital in Belgium when he pulled up to get his hip replacement here. This is a, a, an excellent hospital in Belgium, right? When he pulled up to get his hip replacement, he freaked out. He was like, oh, I'm not going there. You know, my, his father had been in New York Hospital and he was used to the you know, Ronald E. Perlman atrium, which is beautiful, and the diff four different restaurants. Um, but he went in and he had a good outcome. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to speed through. This is about specialist incomes. Uh, this I want to talk about because we're in, you know, devices. Uh, this is uh, the equipment that's used to uh, treat diabetes. Really useful stuff, but again, uh, cures people's, or not cures people's diabetes, helps with their diabetes, uh, allows them to lead productive, long, normal lives, but is putting many of them in financial stress. So how can we do it cheaper? And the thing about diabetes care is it works like my HP printer. Um, you know, I, I get some of the supply, I get the, the equipment cheap, right? I get the printer cheap, but then the cartridge runs out every three seconds and I'm buying, you know, it makes me nuts. I'm spending hundreds of dollars on printer cartridges. A lot of diabetes supplies work the same way. The, the, the uh, equipment is cheap and the supplies are really expensive and the test strips are designed so that they only work with your particular pump. So some opportunities there, I think, to, um, to uh, you know, for interoperability. Um, I'm just going to move on here. Um, this is what patients see, uh, you know, and it gives you a sense of how absurd our system is now. This is a, a bill, f an explanation of benefits for a hip replacement. Um, a guy in New York named Joe Cotugno, he, 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 the hospital charged something like uh, 99000 his insurer paid 60 something um, and he had to pay 3000 and it says so he saved 96% you know yahoo people are smarter than that this is what i i, I this is what i think about our healthcare system that people are smarter um, so i'm just going to quickly run through some of the ideas um, that uh, the big ideas that have come up and where they may f do really well or not really well depending on how you all implement them um, transparency, we have a lot, we see a lot of new businesses focusing on greater transparency in healthcare. And I think generally that's a great thing. Um, part of the problem is, you know, can you get buy-in? This, this is the chart about colonoscopy. Can you get buy-in from providers to provide good transparency data? Often what you find is they give you a number and the number is, oh, that didn't include the anesthesiologist. Oh, that did, you know, that's the ER price, but it didn't include the doctor. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's the kind of airline model of, you know, oh, not your bags. Um, this is a site that I, I admire greatly. Um, it's good, goodricks.com. I don't know if any of you have used it, but I go there every time I need to fill a prescription. It tells you what all the pharmacies in your area, your, your immediate area are charging, and you'll see incredible variants. Um, doctors will say, oh, I, you know, I can't do price transparency. I don't know how much it's going to cost for a particular patient. And what I always say is, yes, but you should know the rack rates. You should know that X MRI is charging 500 while Y MRI is, char is charging 5,000 because the differences are that big. And secondly, I kind of, and this is all for you to think about, I say, well, isn't that what computers are for? If you have your, your patient's insurance information, shouldn't you be able to click a button and know exactly what their copay should, would be? That's what I think we should be aiming for. Um, Devices, you know, they're, they're, you know, we always think of them as like the great new thing. More data is better. This is what I consider a great device. It changed American medicine. Little thing at the pulse oximeter that measures oxygen levels in the blood. Um, not all devices will provide, and again, this is where I say, you know, focus on health, focus on what's useful. Not all devices are going to deliver that. And I think the key when you're thinking about devices is deliver it at an affordable level. This is a device, and I hate to, I'm not, there are many others like it, but I will point to this one because it's new, and I've written about it. Um, it's called Evzio. It, it is a, an auto-injector for naloxone, which is an, anti, uh, an opiate, uh, an antidote to opiate, uh, an opiate overdose. Um, it's a great thing to have around. 
but an antidote, uh, naloxone, when you put it in a syringe, costs $3. It can be delivered through the nose or as an injection. Um, this was meant to allow people to save their loved ones. Um, I don't know which of these people is supposed to have addiction <laughs> issues, but we'll, we'll leave that aside. Um, it's, this is a talking auto-injection. Uh, when I wrote about it, I didn't know the price, but now um, the price is there and it costs uh, over $600. So very few people are gonna be able to use this. Um, elimination of overtreatment is a problem. Um, something, sometimes handheld apps will help, sometimes they won't. When you look at um, the Choosing Wisely campaign of the American Board of Man Internal Medicine, which asked, um, different specialties to point out five things that happened in their specialty that, the specialty that they thought were not a good use of money. I, I always enjoy looking at the American Academy of Ophthalmology because all five things they single out do not affect their income. So there are things like don't get pre-op testing, don't get a pre-op x-ray, fine. This is a challenge which, which we're all going to have to face. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about electronic medical records, which I think can either be used for good or bad. Um, you know, it's wonderful, the idea. We've all converted to electronic medical records. Um, they should be interoperable now, but what you find is that many hospitals deploy electronic medical records first as a way to guard their patients, to not share patients. Even though all hospitals in New York City have ele electronic medical records now, if I go into Lenox Hill Hospital, they will not be able to get my records from New York Hospital because that's the competition. There's not a lot to benefit in sharing. Also, I've seen many medical record systems now programmed to order tests to, as the default. That's gonna be a problem. You know, they're great for certain things, but if every time you go into a hospital and get an x-ray, the default that's programmed into their system is recommend follow-up MRI, that's a problem. That's going to be great for business, but it's not going to be good for health. So anyway, I turn it over to you now. Run with it. There's lots of room for improvement and lots of opportunities, but I hope as you're devising uh, new business models and new innovations that we remember the, the kind of the, the, that first principle that they be good, more good for business than they are for health than they are for business. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. And I'm sorry to go over.